Hello folks, welcome back to the Somerty Masterclass. Hope everyone is doing very well, studying very hard as always. In this presentation, I'm gonna be going through the notes that I've taken out of the ABCs of the UCC on Article 9, which covers secure transactions. Now this is a very, very important article to go over, and make sure you learn, okay, and study so you know inside out. The book itself is the thickest out of all the series of the articles that these guys have done. So I highly recommend going and purchasing it. So it's obviously got even more explanatory depth examples and case law that it references okay that otherwise will help aid us in giving us the reasoning behind why we're doing what we're doing in regards to creating the security agreement against our straw man and finding that on the ucc1 finance statement all the laws and codes governing how to perfect it and make sure that we're doing things correctly as well as how to also control negotiable instruments okay when we get to that point in the future of doing our own secure transactions in order to acquire boats, cars, houses, okay, as the man himself, Peter Joseph Polinsky, provided evidence of doing, okay, which you can only do off the back of having your advanced treasury pack sent in and the bonds cured, the set-off bond and the indemnity bond to allow you to be actually draw and become your own private bank and draw up these negative checks, okay, and have it indemnified where you're effectively underwriting your own instruments with the indemnity bond and then going through the necessary protocols of registration and filing on the UCC, okay, which is why Article 9 is so very important to learn in order to appease all these processes in order to acquire property okay, using your unlimited exemption, your limited credit when it comes to the negative checks and then filling out the necessary 1099 forms in order to control that security that you created okay, in order to get them, the Treasury, to set things off for you okay because they are the drawee you become the drawer they become the drawee they are binded now as trustees to perform on behalf of you who is the executor who executes the order of them to perform for your benefits you're the executive beneficiary okay so it's so very powerful and it also provides good information surrounding like the right of self-help and the things that you can do in regards to if you find yourself um, injured by someone okay or who have acted in dishonor through the private administrative procedure you can get you can then get a certificate of default, okay, and lien their goods up to the value of whatever the certificate of default is. And this obviously teaches you how to do that, where you can either sell it to a broker minus the discount in order to get a payout up front or receive dividend payments on it, okay, or go to a sheriff, get repossession to actually enforce the courts a third party in order to go after the value of what is owed to you, okay, or you have the right of self-help yourself. Okay, in order to go after the assets as long as you're not in breach of the peace. Okay, so, so it's a very, very interesting article to break down. We won't deviate much from the notes because it is otherwise very straightforward and written very simply, okay, in order to understand, um, but so very important in order to learn completely because this is at the very basis, like the foundation of what we're doing with, you know, the security agreement, which is probably the most powerful document on this journey of redemption, okay, along with the UCC1 finance statement. Okay, so yeah, sit tight and um, we'll work through this and it'll be um, very educational. So, as mentioned before in Article 1, at the beginning of this presentation, just to remind ourselves the importance of the international influence of the UCC, even though it's only really being implemented in the United States or expressly implemented in the United States, whereas everyone else it is implicitly being implemented, okay, but I believe that will change in the future, given, you know, the International Institute of the Unification of Private Law and how these guys want to set things up in order to bring across or bring in the New World Order. So, it states the code has become an important US export. Other nations have modelled their laws after our uniform commercial codes. I say our, it's really just the international bankers acting on behalf of the United States. And portions of the code and its principles have been carried over into international instruments such as the United Nations Convention on the International Sale of Goods, the United Nations Convention on the Assignment of Receivables in International Trade, and the International Institute for the Unification of Private Law, Unijoy, as we recollect, under the UCC Connection. Really good book, highly recommend reading it. And if you haven't watched the presentation, please go and watch that because it just gives even more credence to why the UCC is international because Unijoy is located 100 yards down from the Holy See in the Vatican. And every single member state that is signed on to the Unijoit statute is otherwise paying an annual fee to access the copyright to utilize within the given bankrupt domestic corporate 
system, okay, which we call a country. All right, and so they're covertly administering this disguised as statutory jurisdiction, which we all know is otherwise hiding the fact that we're now under Admiralty Maritime jurisdiction, which governs international contracts. Okay, so everything's international now under the UCC. So it continues, Article 9 of the Uniform Commercial Codes governs several types of transactions that have one common element that each involve the transfer of an interest in personal property. By no stretch of the imagination are all transfers of personal property governed by Article 9. Rather, Article 9's main focus and the historical reason for its existence is the consensual transfer of an interest in personal property as security for an obligation. Article 9 also governs a second type of interest in personal property that secures an obligation, which is called an agricultural lien. Now, this is used when going to acquire property, okay, when using that filing. And then with our status correction, we're using a non-UCC filing, which is a secret 30-year maritime lien. However, as you'll see further down in the codes, when ticking debtor as a transmitting utility, we can effectively make that unlimited. But I believe in order to unlock that, you must follow up by sending a letter into the state of where you filed your original UCC one in order to have that exist in perpetuity. Okay, so it's quite, that's quite interesting. Little gem found in the, in the book. So the rights to personal property provide the creditor with specific personal property against which to enforce the secured obligation if it is unpaid or unperformed. The secured party's rights against the debtor on the obligation itself are governed by the body or bodies of law specific to the obligation. For example, Article 3 of the UCC, if the obligation is represented by a negotiable instrument. Okay, you've got Article 2, if the obligation is unpaid sales price for the purchase of goods. Then you've got common law principles if the obligation is represented by a non-negotiable instrument. You've got surety ship law if the obligation is a guarantee or certain consumer protection laws if the obligation is owed by a consumer. Now, Article 9 focuses on the other aspect of the transaction, okay, the creditor's rights to the personal property securing the obligation, which is the security interest. A creditor's security interest is a contingent property interest that rises upon creation but is not fully realized unless there is a default on the secured obligation and the creditor enforces its property interest to satisfy the obligation. Now, it'd be quite interesting to see anyone who's kind of in that mind where they're quite advanced to see whether you can actually get your debtor in default, okay, your straw man debtor in default, and then go through a third party such as the courts to maybe try and bequest, again, okay, have things liquidated that way in order to access the securities that are traded in your name. Okay, like I said, there's so many ways to skin this cat. Likewise, you can even go through just the normal probate process with the courts in order to liquidate your estate, okay, with you becoming the executor, all right, or the personal representative in order to receive the proceeds, okay, that are traded on behalf of the straw man, which obviously the courts and the system will have direct access to in order to bequest to you as the beneficiary. All right, and then obviously with the advanced treasury pack, we're actually binding the treasury as trustees, and we're kind of going through that probate process, albeit slightly different without the courts, okay, in order to set things up. So we can inevitably liquidate the estate on an international level of Puerto Rico as an international trust, okay, when you fill out form 706, 709, 1041, 1041V, etc., cetera, um, and gain access to that master file, right, the QSIP, the SINs and the ISIN master files in order to find what can then be liquidated and actually given and bequested back to us as the entitlement holder, the protected holder and the holder, due, the holder in due course of our birth certificate, which is otherwise what? A beneficial interest certificate, a trust capital unit, trust certificate unit that entitles us to receive everything that's otherwise been made off the back of everything they've securitized, right, in our straw man's name with every instrument that we've signed and assigned a life force to since birth in order to give to us, okay? And we can actually claim compensation and damages too, which is also hidden in these codes, which is why it's so important when going through to get this process done, when writing your letters in order to instruct these guys, now when you are the executor, okay, the person in charge, the sui juris, person of authority to execute your trust, your estate, where they're now binded as trustees, and that's the whole advanced treasury pack, okay? So for those of you who aren't there yet, it will make more sense when obviously you go through that, okay, if you're obviously starting this or going through this before you get to that. I'm making this after the fact that I've done the treasury pack, okay, so I'm waiting for my bonds to cure. Um, so which, either way, which way you do it, it doesn't matter. It's just really important to know, 
okay, um, in order to obviously set things up for you in the future to be able to govern everything and become your own banker, lawyer, underwriter, okay, um, judge, you name it, policeman or woman, okay, you're, you are bringing everything back in house. You're the sovereign, all right? This is true redemption, okay? So it's so important to go over these codes. I know I'm flogging a dead horse, going off tangent a little bit, but it's just important to really hit this home, these concepts, and you know, really start thinking about how to become an international creditor, how to become someone who is in charge, who has the knowledge, and is able to utilize all the tools now that have been you know, gifted to us based on this wonderful wisdom and information we're going through, okay, that we sifted through. And it's a journey. It takes a while to grow into it, um, just as much as it takes to empty your cup of all the dogma right in order to then make room for the correct information, the truth, okay, that will set you free, right? So it continues. First, Article 9 establishes the requirements for a security interest to be created or in Article 9 parlance to attach to a debtor's personal property. When these requirements are satisfied, the security interest can be enforced against both the debtor and third parties with interest in that personal property. Second, Article 9 establishes procedures that the holder of a security interest, the secured party, must follow to increase its ability to prevail over third parties asserting conflicting claims to the personal property or, in Article 9 parlance, to perfect the security interest. Generally, these procedures involve ways to publicize the existence of the security interest. Okay, and that's pretty much the whole idea behind the UCC1 Finance and Statement platform. It's an international public notice platform in order to have that appeased. So we've got third, Article 9 establishes priority rules to resolve disputes between competing claims to the personal property. Fundamental to these priority rules is whether, how and when the security was perfected. Finally, Article 9 governs the enforcement of a security interest if it secures an obligation. Article 9 sets forth the rules a secured party must follow to realise the personal property's value and apply that value to the unpaid obligation. Secure party refers to the creditor who has or will have the benefit of the security interest in personal property if an obligation is secured, and that's codified in 9102A73, and that's what we are with the straw man, okay, pledging all of its security interests to us as creditors. In a sale of accounts, chattel paper, promissory notes, or payment intangibles governed by Article 9, the buyer is the secure party. Now, debtor refers to the person who has the ownership or other interest other than a security interest or lien in the personal property in which the security interest is created. And that's in codified in 9102A28. Okay, and we obviously have the debtor's assets because the straw man is created by the state, even though it's created off the back of our life force. Okay, so it's a funny relationship there where it's kind of like almost two-way. Both of them have rights in the entity itself, but I'd say we have the superior rights when we go through doing this process of securing it and taking back control. Okay, but from the straw man, that is the conduit that they have then used in order to create off the back of that, lynch to us as surety, all of the secure the securities, okay, and the instruments, the so-called checks, drafts, notes, bonds and bills, right, that are then earning a hell of a lot of money each year in annuities and then obviously when we kick the bucket they get a huge payout from the insurance and then it bequests or skeets over to the estate in the bone of a cancer division but that happens after seven years under the SETI KV Act 1666 okay where you declare dead and lost at sea as we've covered in the previous articles and the previous videos that that is basically what is going on but it's our debtor straw man that has the rights to all the assets at the moment and so it's only through the straw man are we able to get our hands on all of the securities and can the money they'd be making off the back of our very existence. Okay, so he is the conduit. The key to all of this is the straw man, who is the debtor, okay, who's the, the one that's sinning all the time. All right, and we've got to accept the Christ, accept the charge, and forgive all debts, and forgive our debtor, straw man too, and forgive those um, who are doing what they've done to us as well in order to find the remedy, all right? So it continues, oblige or refers to the person who owes the obligation in those security interests, that securing obligation. Collateral refers to the personal property in which the security interest is created, codified in 9102A12. Article 9 collateral classification categorizes all tangible personal property as goods. Okay, goods are all the things that are movable at the time 
the security interest attaches, including fixtures, goods attached to real property, some standing timber, some unborn animals, it's quite interesting, crops, manufactured homes, and computer programs embedded in goods, which will soon be a lot of people. And you think about what Elon Musk is getting up to with Neuralink and wanted to chip everyone. It's gonna be, yeah, interesting or precarious situations where, you know, things, people, can be considered owned, right? Patented, copyrighted, and secured, and have security interest in them, okay, from other corporations, uh, which is obviously treading a, tre treading a fine line of not really being in a good situation when it comes to taking away from your sovereignty, your rights, and being a child of God, um, rather than a child of, you know, Satan, this, this technocratic, transhumanist agenda. Anyway, in such a way, so computer programs are better than goods in such a way that the software is considered to be part of the goods. And that's codified in 9102A44. Goods are subcategorized in section 9102 by their use in the hands of the debtor as one of the following. Okay, you've got consumer goods. I'm just going to whiz through this and you guys can read through this in your own time. You've got consumer goods, farm products, inventory, equipment. Okay, and the intangible property, you have chattel paper, deposit account, investment property, instruments, Okay, commercial tort claim, letter of credit, we've covered letter of credit right, and accounts. Okay, then you've got obviously money, documents, general intangibles, payment intangibles, extracted collateral, fixtures. Okay, and that pretty much sums it up. So subsection 1201B35 defines security interest as an interest in personal property that secures payment or performance of an obligation. Agricultural liens are property interests in farm products and are created by a statute outside of Article 9, codified in 9102A5B. We've got Article 9 governs many, but not all, consignments, okay, codified in 9109A4. Consignments governed by Article 9 are those in which the owner, the consigner, delivers goods that are not consumer goods at the time that have an aggregate value of at least 1,000 and that have to be sold by a merchant, the consignee, who deals in goods of that type, codified in 9102A20. You have mixed transactions. A common example of a mixed secured transaction is a promissory note secured by a mortgage. The note constitutes personal property, an instrument, in the hands of the holder. Thus, Article 9 governs when the holder grants a security interest in the note, including perfection of the security interest in the note applying to the mortgage. However, because transfers of interests in real property are excluded from Article 9, subsection 9109D11, other aspects of the mortgage securing the note continue to be governed by real estate law. These issues are frequently involved in foreclosures of mortgages or deed of trust. Now, federal, federal statutes preempt Article 9 for certain aspects of security interests in collateral they govern, such as aircraft, ships, and copyrights, codified in 9109C1. The general rule under Part 2 of Article 9 is that a security interest attaches to specific personal property and becomes enforceable by the secured party against the debtor and third parties upon satisfac satisfaction of three requirements. You've got one, the parties have an adequate security agreement. Two, the secured party gives value. And three, the debtor has rights or the power to transfer rights in the collateral. And that's codified in 9203B. So Article 9 contemplates three distinct types of security interests. The interest of a creditor in personal property that secures payment or performance of an obligation. The interest of a consigner if the consignment is governed by Article 9. And the interest of a buyer of certain payment rights if the sale is governed by Article 9. Now I know a few of you like myself was questioning at the beginning, obviously, when we you know get this process done, when putting the lien against the straw man and coming up with the security agreement, well, what what value is it that we're giving? Okay, because normally in a situation like this, you'd have the the creditor giving a loan or something equivalent, right, in order to then have the right to give value for then the debtor to pledge his security interest in whatever it is he owns. It could be even the car itself if it was used as like a, a car loan, for instance. Okay, in order to secure the repayments, if they were ever to default, they can obviously go after and recollect the car or recollect whatever the property was or all property up to the value, whatever the loan was initially. Okay, so the answers, as always, are hidden in the actual documents that we're putting together. Okay, which is why, again, so important to read through them and understand fully what it is you're doing before you do it. Okay, so as you can read here, in consideration for the secure party providing certain accommodations to debtor into alia to the secured party. Okay, the debtor who deems himself insolvent hereby under necessity grants the above secured party a security interest in the collateral described herein 
on any Schedule A's and as may appear on all UCC filings referred to as collateral to secure all debtors property as well as all so-called income from whatever source derived, direct, indirect, absolute or contingent due or to become due, here and after arising held in any account with its due interest, parole or express public indebtedness and liabilities held by debtor or presented to debtor to secure party in consideration for secured party providing certain things and accommodations for debtor including but not limited to okay so this is the value constituting the source origin substance and being i.e basis of pre-existing claim from which the existence of debtor was derived and on the basis of which debtor is able to function as a transmitting utility to conduct commercial activity as a conduit for the transmission of goods and services to the secured party and to interact contract and exchange goods, services, obligations and liabilities with other debtors, corporations and artificial persons in commerce and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the value we're giving in order to tick off and appease that in the code in order to make sure this is a lawful, valid security agreement. Okay, so really important to read through this. Very powerful security agreement, 18 pages in total. Okay, very, very powerful. The security agreement, okay, is an agreement in which the debtor transfers a security interest in the collateral to the secured party, codified in 9102A74. Thus, it is simply the consensual creation of a property interest. The term security agreement is somewhat of a misnomer because agreement implies a two-party mutual undertaking. The code requires only that the debtor make the agreement to transfer the collateral, that's codified in 9203B3. Although that agreement obviously runs in favour of another, the secured party, a security agreement is more analogous to a mortgage than to a contract, despite the lack of a requirement for both the debtor and the secured party to authenticate, which means sign, the security agreement. Normal requirements of contract law, such as capacity and legality, must be met for a security agreement to be effective. Whether a security agreement is legally adequate depends on certain facts surrounding the creation of the security interest. For most security agreements, attachments requires that the debtor authenticate a security agreement containing a description of the collateral codified in 9203B3A. However, these requirements need not be met if pursuant to the debtor's security agreement, the secured party has obtained one of the following, okay, which is possession of collateral in which a security interest can be perfected by possession. You've got delivery of a certificated security in registered form or control of collateral in which a security interest can be perfected by control. In these cases, the secured party's possession, delivery or control provides evidentiary validation of the security agreement equivalent to the authentication and description requirements. Even though not required by section 9203, the agreement for the security interest is generally expressed in writing or another producible medium simply for its additional evidentiary benefit. Authenticated by debtor, authentication is the concept that replaces signed. A debtor can authenticate a security agreement by either signing it or by attaching to or logically associating with it an electronic sound symbol or process with the present intent to adopt or accept the security agreement. That's codified in 9102A7. The authentication concept facilitates transactions in the electronic age when the formality of a written signature may be cumbersome or unrealistic. There are two important limitations on describing collateral and security agreements. Super generic descriptions such as all personal property are inadequate, codified in 9108C. Three types of security interests are described in subsection 1201B35. These can be distinguished by the terms of the security agreement. Okay, you got one. If the security interest secures an obligation, then according to the definition of security interest in subsection 1201B35, the security agreement must give the secured party an interest in the collateral and indicate that it secures an obligation. The secured obligation or obligation should be identified in the security agreement. Two, if the security interest is a sale of payment rights described in subsection 1201b35, then according to the definition of sale in subsection 21061, the buyer must obtain title. This definition of sale, which relates to goods under Article 2, is incorporated into Article 9 by reference, and that's codified in 9102b. Thus, the seller authenticates an agreement that transfers title to the buyer. The security agreement creating this type of security interest is simply a property transfer document. Three, if the security interest is a consignment described in subsection 1201B35, then according to the definition of consignment in subsection 9102A20, the consigner is the owner and the consignee must receive delivery with the power to sell. Thus, 
the debtor who must authenticate is the consignee and has no property interest initially to be transferred by the security agreement. The consignee obtains possession and a right to sell while the consigner retains ownership. In these transactions, it makes sense for both parties to authenticate the security agreement that creates and delineates these rights, although Article 9 does not expressly require this. Under Article 9, a creditor can obtain a security interest in personal property the debtor now owns, as well as in most property, personal property the debtor will acquire in the future. That's codified in 9204A. Verbiage to include in the security agreement is all present and future obligations of the debtor to the secure party. The secure party's remedies under Part 6 of Article 9 only arise when a debtor is in default, okay, codified in 9601A. Because the code does not define default, a well-drafted security agreement should specify the circumstances under which a debtor will be in default. For security interest, that a true sale of accounts, chattel paper, promissory notes, or payment intangibles, the debtor is the seller, codified in 9102A 28B. To be a sale, the secure party receives title. The last requirement for attachment is that value must be given, although subsection 9203B1 does not specify which party must give value, it is well understood that the secure party gives value or has value given on its behalf. Section 1204 defines value in terms of what is given to acquire rights. In effect, value is the consideration given to acquire the secured party's security interest in the collateral from the debtor. The giving of the value by the secured party, the buyer, in true sales transactions is the payment of or promise to pay the price for the rights. Okay, we've already gone through that. Remember, in the security agreement, this is the value that is being given okay, by us to the debtor which accepts, which we're able to sign and authenticate on behalf of under the code, which is UCC 12137, okay? Any sign, whether electronic or written, can be accepted as a valid signature under the UCC, which is complete colorable law, okay? Which is why we can actually sign on behalf of dead corporate entities, including our straw man debtor and accept it as such under the code of UCC 12137. So we have leases. In essence, the lessee obtains all commercially useful rights to possess and use the property and the lessor retains only the right to the property on default, a transaction functionally equivalent to a secured transaction. Generally, the action that perfects a security interest is one, filing a record known as a financing statement, okay, in official public records, or two, taking possession of tangible collateral or obtaining control of certain intangible collateral. Okay, and that's codified in 310, 312B, 313, and 314. That's why we're filing the financing statement as mentioned before. So we're perfecting, okay, the security interest. Attaching and perfecting. Filing, perf filing perfects the security interest the most collateral, but there are two important exceptions. First, filing cannot perfect the security interest in money, deposit accounts, or letter of credit rights, codified in 9312B. Filing the financing statement is not available for aircraft subject to the re record, subject to the recording system established with the administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration. Likewise, filing the financing statement is ineffective to perfect a security interest in vehicles subject to a certificate of title statute. Okay, now we can do that as long as we issue our own document of title and get your hands on the original MCO, MSO. But when it, when it comes to acquiring property, because we're putting the initial lien on the negotiable instrument, which is the check we'll be using to actually pay and set off the books in order to acquire that given property in the collateral section, we're allowed to put in the necessary property description for a car under an agricultural lien, okay, until it gets released um, when we acquire it. Because once you do send in the check, okay, to the treasury for them to then offset the books and pay the dealership or whoever is the exchanger on behalf of this transaction in order for you to acquire the property, you have every right to lien it, okay, until they release it to you, the rightful owner. A secured party has no obligation to give information regarding its security interest directly to a third party, code of 9210. To be legally effective, a financing statement must provide one, the debtor's name, two, the name of the secured party or its representative, and three, an indication of the collateral covered, code of 9502A. If 
for decadence estates, the name must be that of the decadent, and the fact that a personal representative is administering the collateral must be indicated at another place on the financing statement, Code of Honor 9503A2. So for collateral held in trust, the debtor's name must be the name of the trust. If it has one in the record creating the trust, it must be indicated in another place on the financing statement that the collateral is held in trust, and that's Code of Honor 9503A3. Okay, the peculiar terminology indicates the collateral covered is intended to buttress the idea that the financing statement is a document designed simply to provoke further inquiry. That notion is further evidenced by the rule allowing all assets or all personal property to suffice as an indication of collateral in a financing statement codified in 95042. A financing statement merely puts third parties on notice to make further inquiry, which ultimately leads to reviewing the security agreement. The security agreement creates the security interest in the collateral and must independently identify the collateral. Thus, the description in the financing statement is judged by a lesser standard. If the financing statement does not cover collateral described in the security agreement, the security interest is not perfected. The description of real property should be the same as would be used on a mortgage of the property, okay, the proper legal description. The debtor's signature is not required on a financing statement. However, the debtor must, in an authenticated record, authorise the filing of an initial financing statement, codified in 9509A1. A signed financing statement would accomplish this, okay, but the forms do not have a place for the debtor's signature, which is why you put it in section eight of the form. Okay, as you can see here, debtor, you can literally just type this out when you put the filing together and then you just obviously sign on behalf of your straw man and then sign in your private capacity, last name, first name, middle, or however you wish to sign, it doesn't really matter. So the definition of transmitting utility, this is an interesting one, uh, is quite broad, quoted in subsection 9102A81 and includes all persons primarily engaged in the business of operating a railroad, subway, street, railway or tro trolley bus. This is obviously in the conventional commercial world, but again, they, we're all tied into this Babylonian system of commerce through these analogies where they pledge us all as these kind of conduits, right? Um, and goods. So transmitting communications electrically, electromagnetically or by light. I mean, that's pretty much what we're doing. That's what the straw man is doing for us in order to speak, act, buy and sell in the world of commerce. Okay, it's the mark of the beast, our trademark 666. Okay, so we're transmitting light into it, giving it life. Transmitting goods by pipeline and sewer, transmitting or producing and transmitting electricity, our life force, steam, gas or water. Okay. So this is interesting. In most cases, a financing statement lapses at the end of five years, okay, codified in 9515A, if, however, the debtor is a transmitting utility and that fact is stated on the initial financing statement, then the financing statement never lapses. It must be expressly terminated, and that's codified in 9515F. So for those, obviously, when we do go and do our filing, we do select debtor is a transmitting utility, okay, as you can see down here. However, in order to have this, because I've obviously filed this and it's only five years, okay, on the record. So whether it's something you have to put in the collateral, whether it's something you have to actually get in touch with the offices there at the UCC filing office in order to reiterate, to unlock this unlimited time, which would be obviously favorable. So don't have to worry about doing a continuation statement every you know, four and a half years, okay, which isn't really a big deal, but if they say it is so under the code, then we should, you know, cite that. Maybe so I might send a letter in and try and get that unlocked because I know Peter Joseph Polinsky, if you search on the New York QCC search list on the database there, you can see his um, filing is until 2,999. He's got a thousand year record, okay, or lifespan on his current UCC1 filing. So any, any finance statement that is about to elapse may be extended for a five-year increment by filing a continuation statement. Okay, finally, a continuation statement will not be effective unless it is filed within the last six months of the financing statement's five-year or 30-year life. Codified in 9510C and 95515D, there is no limit on the number of times a finance statement can be continued. Okay, so just if you can't unlock getting the unlimited lien, then obviously just do a continuation statement every four and a half years, make sure it's within the six months lapse date, okay, of the filing expiry. If the document is negotiable,
Perfection can be obtained by perfecting a security interest in the doc document of title, and that's codified in 9312C1. If the debtor holds securities indirectly through one or more financial intermediaries, the debtor's rights to the securities are called a security entitlement, codified in 8102A7 and A17. If the debtor is a broker or securities intermediary, which includes clearing corporations, a security interest in the debtor's investment property is automatically perfected, and that's codified in 93010 interesting what if we could put a filing in as the dtc okay and fidelity and all these guys who are otherwise you know holding our securities right on the books in order for them to you know release them so again you, when going through these codes you can think of so many different scenarios of being able to kind of invoke it in order to try and gain access you know to the securities that are being traded in our name that we have every right to do so it continues again about air aircrafts, which are quite interesting. They have recording requirements with the administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration. Vessels, railroad cars, locomotives and rolling stock or accessories have a filing system established with the Surface Transportation Board and ship mortgages on documented vessels must be filed with the Secretary of Transportation. The United States is located in the District of Columbia. Interesting how that's codified in 9307H. So they just chucked that in there. That's quite interesting. The location of the debtor when the collateral is held in the common law trust requires careful analysis. The trust is not the owner of the collateral, the trustee is. A holder in due course of a negotiable instrument takes free of competing claims, that's codified in 3306. One becomes a holder in due course of a negotiable instrument if it does not bear evidence that calls into question its authenticity by taking possession with the proper endorsement in good faith, full value, and without notice of adverse claims, defenses, or other specified problems. Okay, codified in 3302. Remember, we've gone through that. Banks have common law bankers' liens and rights of set off, even when they do not have a security interest. A good that is attached to another good without losing its identity is referred to as an accession. Okay, codified in 9102A1. Accession example if you buy a car, then later on you want to put new parts on it, that is an accession. Okay. Some of the secured parties' state law rights are lost if the debtor files bankruptcy. The security interest is not titled to the personal property. Any attempt to retain title to secure obligations is treated merely as a security interest, codified in 1201B35 and 24011. There are three basic remedies available to realize the collateral's value. Okay, you've got one, collect from or obtain performance by third parties, debt collectors, okay, sheriffs, whatever. If the collateral consists of rights to payment or performance by those third parties, subsection 9607, Foreclose, sell, lease, license, or otherwise dispose of the collateral, go to find a 9610. Strictly foreclose, accept the collateral in full, or partial satisfaction of the debt, and that's code to find a 9620. Article 9 permits the secure party to sue the obliger for any deficiency, code to find a 9608A4 and 9615D2. As an interest in the nature of a lien, a security interest is a contingent right to property which generally can be exercised only upon a debtor's default, okay, and that is in 9601A. The parties, not Article 9, define the default in the security agreement. If the parties fail to define default, courts will probably hold that non-payment of the secured obligation constitutes a default, okay, and that's in that case, Wisen Hunt versus Alan Parker back in 1969. Secured party can conduct a foreclosure while the collateral is still in the debtor's possession, that's code of 9609A2. If the debtor does not voluntarily surrender collateral, Article 9 creates a right of self-help to repossess the collateral. Okay, code of 9609B2. The only restriction on self-help repossession is that it must be accomplished without a breach of the peace. Okay, now this is quite interesting. Okay, so in the book on page 132 and 133, I'm just going to read this out. That elaborates a little bit more about this. Okay, so repossession. Although a secure party can conduct a foreclosure while the collateral is still in the debtor's possession, as a practical matter to realize on tangible collateral or collateral represented by instruments, negotiable documents or certificated securities, a secure party generally, generally wants to first obtain dominion and control over the collateral. If the secure party is not already in possession, it can require the debtor, after default, to assemble the collateral and make it available to the creditor at a reasonably convenient place, whether or not this right is provided in the security agreement. Subsection 9609C, if the debtor does not voluntarily surrender collateral, 
Article 9 creates a right of self-help to repossess the collateral. The only restriction on self-help, possess, repossession, as we mentioned, is that it must be accomplished without a breach of the peace. And it continues, Article 9 makes no attempt to define breach of the peace. Furthermore, the parties are not free to agree upon standards for determining whether the secured party met its duty of not breaching the peace. That's codified in 9603B. This leaves the question in the hands of the court. Okay, the courts have construed breach of the peace broadly to prohibit repossessions involving breaking and entering infractions of the law, ignoring requests to cease and reliance on colour of authority, involvement of government authorities without obtaining proper court orders. A secure party who breaches the peace and repossessing may incur liability to the debtor for conversion, including liability for punitive damages. This liability includes vicarious liability for the actions of its agents. Thus, if a secured party hires an independent company to repossess a debtor's automobile and the employees of that company breach the peace while repossessing, the secured party will bear the legal consequences of their actions. The code does not create a mechanism for repossession if self-help fails. Legal action is then required by resort to the non-cone remedy of replevin, okay, or its equivalent, with court assistance in obtaining possession. That's Code of Honor 9609B Part 1. A secure party has two other options. It can pursue an action in conversion, which awards damages rather than possession, or it can pursue a judicial foreclosure, which will result in possession by levying on the property. Okay, so that's very, very interesting. And obviously, these are the rights that are afforded to any secure party creditor, okay, given private administrative procedure. If you find yourself in that situation, you have these, you have access to these rights, okay, as long as you're not seen to be breaching the peace. Likewise, if they're coming after you and breaching the peace, which we know this is all fraudulent because they've sold that bloody security so many times and already got tax write-offs on it, got insurance payouts on it, okay, and they're just coming after you just for the fun of it, that you can also sue them for that and claim breach of the peace and go after them for damages, punitive damages, etc. Okay, so very interesting. And we've got a bit more on replevin down here, which is also very interesting. So redemption in the book is defined means freeing the collateral from the security interest. Now that is the process that we're all going through, right? The redemption process, okay, is relieving and releasing all of the property, all of the assets, all the securities, all the annuities, all the rights, okay, and things that have been accrued in our straw man name that should be, you know, deposited to us for our benefit within the system of what they set up with the SETI KV Trust, okay, but because of their tricks and traps and the subrogations, they've kept all that wealth for themselves, okay, so it's a matter of, matter of us coming back to life, as mentioned in all the previous videos, being competent and seen to present the right documents you know, and administering our estate, say, hey, look, we've come back to life, we're no longer lost, you know, dead and lost at sea. We have every right now to seek redemption and have it all gifted, bequested, transferred back to us, okay, plus damages, compensation. So good faith, again, the code requires each party to act in good faith, codified in 1203. Acting in good faith is also explicitly required in some sections of Article 9, Article 9 adopted the expanded good faith concept when, which includes observing reasonable commercial standards of fair dealing as well as acting honestly in fact. Okay, that's codified in 1201B20 and 9102A43. The requirement to act in good faith has been relied on in a number of court decisions to hold secure parties liable to debtors. Significant damages have been awarded when a secure party's actions surrounding the extension of credit all the exercise of rights and remedies were found not to be in good faith. And the abstract foreclosure transfers the debtor's rights to the secured party, discharges the security interest under which the strict foreclosure was made and discharges subordinate security interest and liens. And then finally, we got replevin, also called a revindication, a form of lawsuit in common law countries such as England, Commonwealth countries and the United States for return of personal property wrongfully taken and for compensation for resulting loss. Okay, again, think of our situation. What have they taken away from us? A procedure whereby seized goods may be provisionally restored to their owner pending the outcome of an action to determine the rights of the parties concerned. Okay, replevin or claim and deliveries as a legal remedy which enables a person to recover personal property taken wrongfully or unlawfully and to obtain compensation for resulting losses. I mean, all of this, given our situation, if you're 
smart about it, really sat down, did your homework and put together a claim to go for the courts, you can probably have this done, you know, and really go after what is right for yours and all the tricks and traps and the subterfuge that's been used with this whole clandestine activity that they've got set up with our straw man ever since our birth. So finally, we've got a really brilliant series again by Law Shelf that I highly recommend you guys go away and watch in your own time that covers pretty much everything that we've just gone over and what the book otherwise covered because these presentations are all modeled off of these book series, which are brilliant, which I highly recommend obviously going to buy to read in your own time. I know it's a lot to unpack, guys. With all these articles, we've gone through what Article 1, um, Article 3 and 4, Article 5, seven, eight, and now nine. Okay, so that's seven books, seven presentations in total. Obviously, a lot of them tie into one another and to the next steps on this journey when it comes to you know the recruitment process, understanding the securities markets, all the intermediaries, okay, and the procedures and processes involved. But this is like foundational. This is like a must know. Okay, and what I might do, keep an eye out, is I might go through all of the notes again and just pick out the ones, okay, that have, that can apply to our situation, that are kind of key, that you might want to consider when you're dealing with these guys that otherwise help give you the, the reasoning and the rights for doing what we're doing when it comes to, you know, putting liens, making secure transactions, drafting up a security agreement with the relationship we have with our straw man under the status correction, okay, and some of the rights and remedies and recourses offered to us when recouping and coming after, you know, our redemption, effectively in redeeming what is rightfully ours, our wealth, you know, that has been bestowed and gifted to us in the last will and testament from God and the Holy Bible, all right, and accepting the Christ, accepting the charge, no longer being belligerent, incompetent, okay, having full knowledge of the law, full knowledge of the codes that are governing these legal, colourable seas of securities, okay, and not complaining, taking charge, growing up, snapping out the child archetype, doing the painful yards, okay, putting in the effort now in order to benefit from the future, delay gratification, okay, and um, you will get yourself there. I mean, we're on our way, definitely on our way, okay, and then once you're in that position, like, a load of people have you know gone through the process themselves like Peter Joseph Polinsky okay you'd be able to start to you know you'd be able to be confident enough to start going off and doing these things where you can actually acquire assets through the whole secure transaction process once you have the knowledge of the recruitment process when it comes to the 1099 forms drafting up your negative checks in order to balance the books okay and just understanding the procedure, basically. It's all about procedure then, okay, once you understand all these codes, it's just a matter of knowing what forms to fill out and the procedures behind them, okay, and going through the, jumping through the right hoops, okay, sending them off to the right gatekeepers, all right? So keep an eye out for that. I probably will go through, so I think it'll be very beneficial to kind of put together a master code sheet of everything that applies to us. Likewise, in the previous presentations, you saw the, important code, especially in Article 7, where I've got in red italic, okay, the further explanation of how it applies to us. I'll go through every single one and pick out the most important points and probably just do a final video to conclude it all, okay, so you have that as a master copy of all the codes going forward for you to learn in order to give you more confidence and reasoning and the rights that you can invoke and cite with these guys in order to get things done. Okay, so thanks so much for watching and being patient. I know it's like watching paint dry for a lot of this stuff, um, but it's just a, you know, repetition is key. Get this on repeat, okay, until it's ingrained in your subconscious, seven times exposure, um, before you know it, like riding a bike, you'll be a master of all this stuff, and you can start moving forward and punching through new barriers, new levels, where no doubt we'll experience new devils, okay, but we're on the rise. This is the ascension. The elevation again it's all down to you at the end of the day so give yourself a pat on the back you're doing tremendous work you are bringing the light back on this planet okay so you have every right and you do deserve to come back into your wealth that is locked away okay we're just waiting for you to unlock it okay it's all down to you at the end of the day you are the remedy all right 
So thanks for watching guys and I'll see you next time if I make that video. If it's not there, then you have all the information anyway to go through and pick out all the necessary codes. Okay, but um, thank you for your time and I'll see you soon. Thanks so much. Take care now. Bye-bye.